Will the House of Windsor turn into a house of cards? What happens to British society when the class structure that underpins it is challenged? Imagine a society founded on a class structure with the white British royal family at the top, as determined by birth and by blood. A biracial woman enters the top of the pyramid by marriage, negating both the birth and blood requirements society had previously been told were preconditions. Because she lacks those prerequisites, she's considered unworthy. Because she's proud of her own heritage and regards herself as equal to others at the top of the pyramid, she's considered ungrateful. The town criers called out from the lower tiers of the pyramid. I've never met her, but I look at her and I think I don't think I'd like you in real life, said one. We Brits prefer true royalty to fashion royalty, proclaimed another. Shouts of, she just doesn't speak our language, came whistling on the wind. But at the top of the pyramid, the cries were met with silence. Were they too far away to hear it? Were they too disconcerted to know what to reply? Or did they use the cacophony from below to muffle the echo of their own whispers as they murmured the same things? The loudest gossip monger was impossible to ignore as he oafishly admonished her to go back to America. After years of being told that she was unworthy and ungrateful, the newlywed took the crier's advice and returned from whence she came. Despite one tattler's audacious cautions not to force her husband to choose between you and us, he did in fact choose his wife, just as he did the day he married her, much to their chagrin. Ironically, though society spurned her placement at the top of the pyramid, when she leaves with her husband, for some, it calls into question whether the pyramid's peak is still something to aspire to, whether those at the top are truly elite, whether blood and birth really are prerequisites. Their departure is considered a rejection of the pyramid as a construct, thus a rejection of the society itself. For others it was a necessary repudiation, and confirmed that just as they suspected she was NOCD, not our class dear. Still, that wasn't enough. For society to maintain order, she must be reclassified and her elite status conferred by marriage removed. But the society is trapped in a conundrum. Her husband and their children are at the top of the pyramid by birth and by blood. Removing titles, military honors, and patronages won't remove her from the top of the pyramid. The only thing that will reclassify her is to remove her from her husband. And the society has been working diligently though unsuccessfully, to that end, since the day they learned that Harry and Meghan were a couple. House of Windsor II, Prince Harry and the Flight of Icarus A biracial woman enters the top of the pyramid by marriage, because she lacks the birth and blood prerequisites, she's considered unworthy. Because she's proud of her own heritage and regards herself as equal to others at the top of the pyramid, she's considered ungrateful. One woman reigns supreme, but for most at the top of the pyramid, birthrights are still passed down through the male line. This paradox is the Pandora's box of being a royal bride. The prince had to up his game to win her and convince her to be his wife, but remember, her elite status was conferred by marriage, not by birth and by blood. So while he wanted a teammate to walk beside him, the society saw her place as three steps far behind. He felt grateful to have found a wife that was strong enough to be able to stand up for what they believe in together. But to the society, she was not a partner, not his equal. She was meant to be a mere shadow, his assistant, unworthy of sharing the spotlight, much less standing in her own. Undaunted, the prince pushed his wife forward through doors and receiving lines. His pride became her protocol breaks, courtly gestures befitting a prince of the realm, but not when they were bestowed on a biracial woman perceived to be more bedwench than beloved. He remembers the heckling from the town criers. She has failed my mum test, one said. His family's whispers floated through palace corridors, counting down his degree wife, with the sly reminder that one steps out with actresses, one doesn't marry them, still ringing in his ears. Those at the top of the pyramid bided their time. They curtsied to her in one moment, 
and cursed her in the next, confident that eventually blood will out. The prince was equally confident that once the people met his wife, they would love her just as much as he did. The people did love her, just not PLU, people like us. While those at the top of the pyramid continued to look askance, the couple were cheered by those on the lower tiers who had never felt the top was for them or who wanted the pyramid abolished on its face. Somewhat cautiously, as they had been fooled before, a wind rush of welcome followed by a long, cold goodbye, they celebrated this marriage. For them, the prince and his wife were a breath of fresh air, a symbol to all that the society could breathe new life. Trapped in the labyrinth, the younger son in spare, the prince had always known that he would never be king. Though his wife would never be placed on the throne, he put her on a pedestal that rose even higher. In front of the society's gaze, the adoration in his eyes said that she was worthy, that she was cherished, that she was loved. He would not force her to be less than she was, to bow and scrape, in order to convince the society that she was grateful. That was not what he wanted for his wife. That was not what he wanted for his life. His son was not growing up like that, he fatefully told a friend, but those at the top of the pyramid would not tolerate anything less than an English blood rose. They would poison the couple's work, and more tragically, their marriage in an effort to kill both. Because his pride in his wife contradicted the society's scorn, they began to look at him differently. The valiant prince they praised through every scrap and scrape was no longer considered dutiful. The court jester whose laddish ways made him the nation's favorite son was now a pariah. Ten years of service to queen and country discarded in the blink of an eye. The price to be paid for bringing a woman so unworthy and ungrateful into their midst was steep. Because he dared to elevate his wife to the top of the pyramid, the town criers called him a shadow of his former self, a hostage to his own desires, completely beguiled and enthralled by his cunning wife. Once a prince among men, he is now branded less than a man. The prince began to look at the society differently in kind. For the first time, his birthright was not enough to protect him, much less his wife and child. Dropped like a ton of hot bricks by those he thought would come to his aid, now he stood alone. He was willing to slay dragons and battle back naysayers whom he once called friend and brother. The prince's marriage vows must now supersede his vow to protect the crown. Hope takes flight. Even the top of the pyramid has levels. The sixth in line to the throne and his wife can never be the pinnacle of society, doubly so when his biracial bride was never meant to reach that level at all. What message would it send to those in the lower tiers of the pyramid, all those who cheered them in the crowds, if a woman so unworthy and ungrateful was not put back in her place? Would they question whether they too could attain the pyramid's peak? Whether blood and birth really were prerequisites? Whether blood and birth truly made you elite? That's it for now. Please like, subscribe, share, donate, etc. If you would like to make a donation and you don't know how, to help support this channel, you can go to the comments section where you can find links to the Patreon, the PayPal, and the Cash App. Thanks for watching Royal Sussex.